Hello, it's Fidel and Nagorn. Today we're going to be solving October and November 2019, Paper 1, Variant 2. And before we start, I'd highly appreciate it if you would take a moment and subscribe to this channel and like this video if it offers you any value. We are offering free Topic 1 notes. All you have to do is fill in the form in the description box down below. We are also selling Topic 2 notes, which include all the tips, tricks of Paper 1, and common misconceptions with worked examples too. Upon purchase, you can ask us unlimited number of questions about the topic or past paper questions for free, and you are able to exclusively contact us at any time, which is a new and unique service. We also have another monthly service, which you can ask us a limited number of questions and past paper questions for the full AS Biology syllabus, only for $12 per month. Question number one, a student calibrated the scale on an eyepiece graticule in the eyepiece lens of a light microscope. The student was given the stage micrometer scale to use. The division on the stage micrometer scale were 0.1 millimeters apart. Which data must the student collect in order to calibrate the eyepiece graticule? Now, first of all, you must distinguish between the eyepiece graticule and the stage micrometer. Here we can see the stage micrometer. And the ruler divided to 100 divisions at the bottom is going to be the eyepiece graticule. And here it's telling us that the divisions on the stage micrometer were 0.1 millimeters apart. So each division is 0.1 millimeters apart. Now, in order to calibrate the eyepiece graticule, the only step we must do is we divide 0.1 millimeters or you can just convert it to micrometers by the number of units covering the eyepiece graticule. In this case, it's 40. This would give you the size of each unit on the eyepiece graticule and you've got it fully calibrated. Therefore, only step three is going to be the correct answer. Therefore, the answer is going to be D. Number two, the diameter of living cells varies considerably. Using these measurements, what is the maximum number of each cell type which could fit along the one centimeter long line? Now here I've converted the one centimeters to micrometers and nanometers. And here we have the number of white blood cells. So white blood cells are eukaryotic cells. Therefore, what we must do is we divide 10,000 micrometers by 1.5 times by 10 to the power of one micrometers the size of eukaryotic cells and this would give us in this case 6.7 times by 10 to the power of 2. Now in order to calculate the number of streptococcus cells, streptococcus is basically a prokaryotic cell. What we must do because here the size is in nanometers we divide 10 million nanometers and that's the size of one centimeter long by 7.5 times by 10 to the power of 2 nanometers and this would give us 1.3 times by 10 to the power of 4 and the answer is going to be C. Question number 3. Which structures are found in animal cells and in plant cells? Now, centrioles. Centrioles are only found in animal cells, so this is incorrect for two lysosomes. Yes, animal cells and plant cells do have lysosomes that contain hydrolytic enzymes, so this is correct. Three, nucleolus. Yes, animal cells and plant cells, because they are eukaryotic cells, they do contain a nucleolus, so this is correct. For vacuole. Yes, animal cells contain temporary small vacuoles, while plant cells contain a large permanent vacuole. So this is also correct, and the correct answer is going to be C. Question number four, which features shown in the diagram can be present in eukaryotes? Let's start with DNA. So DNA is found in two locations in eukaryotes. First, in the nucleus of the cell, which contains a linear DNA, and in the mitochondria or chloroplasts, and chloroplast if it's a plant cell which contains circular dna so this is correct for to rna rna is present as ribosomal rna and mrna which are both present in eukaryotic cells so this is correct three 70s ribosomes 70s ribosomes are present in chloroplast and in mitochondria Therefore, this is correct for peptidoglycan cell walls. So peptidoglycan cell walls are only present in prokaryotic cells. And therefore, this is going to be incorrect. And the correct answer is going to be A. 
Number 5. For students who are asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell, which student correctly matched the numbered function with the appearance of the cell structure? Now let's start with 1. Organizes microtubules to produce the spindle during cell division. Now during prophase, what organizes the microtubules are the centrioles made of microtubules. Now, for one, we have the suggestions between W and Y. Let's look at W. Non-membrane bound spherical structures. So, this is going to be the ribosomes. Because ribosomes are not actually surrounded by membrane. And we have Y. Non-membrane bound cylindrical structures. So, cylindrical structures are microtubules. And centrioles are made of microtubules. So, one is going to be Y. 2. Synthesis of polypeptides. So, polypeptides are synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum containing ribosomes. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have for 2. We have either W or Z. As we said, W represents the ribosomes. Therefore, 2 is going to be W. Now for three, synthesis of lipids. As we all know, lipids and steroids, such as cholesterol, are synthesized in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. Let's start with V. Membranes which surround an enclosed inner cavity. So an enclosed inner cavity represents a tubular structure. And a tubular structure is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be V and the answer is going to be C. Question number six, which types of RNA are present in prokaryotic cells and in eukaryotic cells? Now we have here mRNA and tRNA. As we all know that prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells both need to synthesize proteins. Therefore, mRNA is needed for transcription and tRNA is needed for translation. Therefore, both must be present. Now, we all also know that prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells contain ribosomes, while eukaryotic cells contain both 70S and 80S ribosomes, prokaryotic cells contain 70S ribosomes. And we all know that ribosomes are made from ribosomal RNA and ribosomal proteins. Therefore, ribosomal RNA must be present, and the answer is going to be A. Question number seven, a student carried out four tests for biological molecules on a solution. The results are shown in the table. Which three molecules may be present in this solution? Now let's first identify the tests. Now for iodine test for a starch, and a positive test would be from brown to a blue-black color. And because it stayed orange-brown, this means that it's a negative test for a starch, so starch cannot be present in this case. Now, for beer rats test, it tests for the presence of proteins. And a positive test would be from blue to purple. And because it turned purple, this means it's a positive test for proteins, and proteins are present. Now, for Benedict's solution, it tests for the presence of reducing sugars. And a positive test would be from blue to brick red color, or any color around, along the Roy G. Biff scale. Therefore, orange is also going to be a positive test for reducing sugars, so reducing sugars are present. And for the emulsion test, here it says a clear observation. And emulsion test tests for the presence of fats. This means that fats are not present and this is negative for the presence of fats. Because a positive test will be a milky emulsion, not a clear one. Therefore, the correct answer must be B. And D in this case is going to be incorrect because here it mentions sucrose. And sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. Therefore, it will not give a positive test with Benedict's solution alone. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. The student was asked to estimate the concentration of reducing sugar in an unknown solution using the Benedict's test. Five reducing sugar solutions with different concentrations were provided in order to produce a calibration curve. The student added 2 cm cubed of Benedict's solution to each of the reducing sugar solutions, heated them in a water bath, and recorded the time taken for the first appearance of a color change. Which variables should the student standardize when carrying out the Benedict's test on each reducing sugar solution to ensure the results are comparable. 
Now, let's first start by explaining the basis of that test. Now, as you all know, that Benedict's test is a semi-quantitative. This means that the concentration of reducing sugars could be estimated by the color change of the Benedict solution. Let's give you an example here. We start by Roy G. Biff. And the color starts from blue and then changes to brick red, with brick red being the highest concentration of reducing sugars. Therefore, the color change could possibly indicate the concentration of the reducing sugar present. Now, Let's answer the question here. It says, what variables should the student standardize? Now, one, volume of reducing sugar used. Yes, the volume should be standardized because the concentration of reducing sugars does impact the color change and impacts the time where the color change takes place for two, the temperature of the water bath. Now, the temperature of the water bath should be also kept constant. The reason for this is that as the temperature increases, the kinetic energy of particles also increase. And if the kinetic energy of particles increase, this may cause that the color change comes along faster. Therefore, it must be standardized. The time the solutions are heated. So the timing which they are heated will not actually impact the result. The reason for this is that as we mentioned, the color of the Benedict solution is what indicates the concentration of reducing sugar approximately. Therefore, the time taken to heat it will not impact the color. Therefore, this is incorrect and the correct answer is going to be B. Question number nine, which rows shows the chemical groups present in the biological molecules listed? Now, amino acids, presence of carboxyl groups. Let's first draw the amino acid molecule. As we see here, there's a carboxylic acid group present, therefore this is correct, and the presence of two or more hydroxyl groups. As we see here, there's only one hydroxyl group visible, therefore this is incorrect, and one's going to be correct. For two, beta-glucose, presence of carboxyl groups. Beta-glucose never contains carboxyl groups, so therefore this is correct, the no is correct and presence of two or more hydroxyl groups. As we all know, beta-glucose contains one hydroxyl group above the ring and other hydroxyl groups as well, therefore this is correct, as you could see on any diagram. For three, glycerol, presence of carboxyl groups. Glycerol is an alcohol and it does not contain a carboxyl groups because carboxyl groups are only present in acids, therefore this is correct. So it's no. And presence of two or more hydroxyl groups. As you all know, glycerol forms ester bonds with three fatty acids. If it forms ester bonds with three fatty acids, this means that it contains three hydroxyl groups. Therefore, no is an incorrect answer. So it cannot be three. For four. Presence of carboxyl groups for fatty acids, as we said, acids do have carboxyl groups, so this is correct. Presence of two or more hydroxyl groups. Now, this is incorrect. It only contains the hydroxyl group within the carboxyl group. Therefore, this is correct. And the correct answer is going to be 1, 2, and 4, which is B. Question number 10, the diagram shows the formation of a biological macromolecule. Which type of bonds are formed in the macromolecule product? Now here we could see a glycerol molecule and almost eight fatty acids. So the glycerol containing three hydroxyl groups and fatty acids molecules. And here we could see the ester linkage. This means that ester bond is formed. An ester bond is formed, as you can see here, by the removal of one hydrogen of the hydroxyl group and the full hydroxyl group of the carboxylic acid to form a molecule of water. And then an ester bond is formed. Therefore, A is going to be the correct answer. Question number 11. Fibrous proteins are composed of chains of amino acids held together by bonds. An example of part of a fibrous protein is shown. 
which type of bond is at X and Y. Let's first start with X. X here, we could clearly see a hydrogen bond occurring between the partially positive hydrogen atom and the partially negative oxygen atom. And we could see that it's occurring between the atoms within the peptide bond. If this takes place, this means that it's the secondary structure, hydrogen bonding within the secondary structure. Therefore, X is going to be hydrogen bonding. And as we said, it's secondary. For Y, here we could see a peptide bond. This is supposed to be a carbon. And we could see a peptide bond formed here. And peptide form bonds are formed in the primary structure of proteins. Therefore, this is correct, and the answer is going to be B. 12. Which row about the structure of proteins is correct? Let's start with the primary structure. The definition for the primary structure of a protein is a sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. Now, let's start with A. Is the number of amino acids present in a protein. As we said, it's not the number, it's the sequence of amino acids. Therefore, this is going to be incorrect. For B, is the order of amino acids present in a protein encoded by the DNA? This is correct. It is the order of amino acids and they are encoded by the DNA. So this is also correct. C, is the result of translation of an mRNA molecule by a ribosome into a chain of amino acids? So the translation would also be in a specific sequence of amino acids determined by the DNA and this is the primary structure so this is correct for D is the sequence of amino acids in a protein this is also correct now let's move on to secondary structure so the secondary structure is the hydrogen bonding formed between the partially positive oxygen atom and the partially negative oxygen atom between atoms of the peptide bond a is the left-handed spiral formed by the primary structure. So here we're talking about the left-handed spiral and it's going to be the alpha helix, which is determined by the sequence of amino acids in the primary structure. And this is correct. B is the coiling of a chain of amino acids to form a B-pleated sheet. B is the coiling of a chain of amino acids to form a beta-pleated sheet or alpha helix. Yes, two types of secondary structure are beta pleated sheets and alpha helix but beta pleated sheets are bound a bit loosely into this type of structure and it's a secondary structure formed between parallel sides so this is also correct c occurs because of the attraction between hydrogen and oxygen atoms in the peptide bonds we just mentioned that this is correct between the partially positive hydrogen and the partially negative oxygen atom forming the bonds for D, is formed by hydrogen bonding between amino acids forming the primary structure. This is correct. Now, quaternary structure. The definition of quaternary structure is the joining of two or more polypeptide chains by bonds between the R groups or the side chains. Now, for the quaternary structure, we're talking about bonds between the R groups, unlike the secondary structure, which are between the peptide bonds. So, the type of bonding present in quaternary structure between the R groups is going to be hydrogen, hydrophobic, ionic, and disulfide, with disulfide being the strongest type of bonding because it's covalent. Now for A is the subunit polypeptides that link together to form a protein, this is also correct contains two types of polypeptide that interact as you said it's two or more it doesn't necessarily mean it's only two therefore this is incorrect now for c is formed by four polypeptides and an additional reactive group attached to a protein now here it's only limiting to four polypeptides this is incorrect it can be two or more and here it says an additional reactive group attached to it so here we're talking about the prosthetic group And the prosthetic group is any type of group that is not made of amino acids and this is present in quaternary structure so this would be correct but for here is incorrect so c is incorrect for d is formed by the linking together of more than one polypeptide to form a protein this is correct more than one polypeptide and the answer is going to be d number 13 a student wrote four statements about water 
which statements are correct. Let's start with one. Water has a high specific heat capacity, which maintains the temperature of water within cells. So the specific heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to change the temperature of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now, water having a high specific heat capacity means that it does not change temperature easily. Why you would ask is because it needs to absorb a higher amount of energy in order to change temperature. Now, this concept maintains the temperature of water within cells, so this is correct. Same with two. Mammals rely on water having a relatively low latent heat of vaporization to keep them cool. Now, latent heat of vaporization is the energy needed to change state of a substance. Now here it says relatively low. Now this is incorrect. It's supposed to be relatively high. Because this means that it needs to absorb a higher amount of energy in order to change state. Therefore, this is incorrect. Three, when a negatively charged ion is added to water, the partially positive charge on the hydrogen atom is attracted to the ion. Now, as you said, an ion is a charged molecule and it's negatively charged. So negatively charged would definitely be attracted to the positive charge forming an ionic bond. So this is correct. Four, when surrounded by water, non-polar molecules tend to be pushed apart from one another. Now, they're actually pushed closer together, not apart. This concept is seen in lipid droplets. Why do we see lipid droplets in the first place? It's because water keeps pushing them close together into one area. Therefore, this is incorrect. And the correct answer is going to be 1 and 3, which is B. Question number 14. Which statement about the active site of an enzyme is correct? A. It always has a specific fixed shape. Now, this is incorrect. The reason for this is because there's a concept called induced fit hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that when a substrate interacts with the bonds within the active site, the active site is stimulated to slightly change shape and mold around the substrate. So it changes shape and molds around the substrate in order to have a more complementary attachment. Therefore, this is incorrect. For B, it reduces the total energy of the product. It reduces the activation energy, but not the total energy of the product. Therefore, this is incorrect. It reduces the activation energy by providing an alternative pathway for the reaction with a lower energy. Now for C, it does not form chemical bonds with its substrate. Now, as we all know, here in the tertiary structure, there are amino acids with R groups. And what happens is that when the substrate enters the active site, it binds with the R groups interactions on the tertiary structure of the active site. Therefore, this is incorrect. It must form chemical bonds in the first place, otherwise it cannot actually be broken. For D, it is determined by the primary structure of the enzyme. Now, as we said, what makes up the shape of the active site is the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure, or the bonds, or the R groups, are determined by the sequence of amino acids and the sequence of amino acids are the primary structure. Therefore, the primary structure is responsible for the type of bonding formed in the tertiary structure. Therefore, this must be correct and the answer is going to be D. Question number 15. When investigating the rate of reaction of the enzyme lipase on the hydrolysis of triglycerides, the pH must be maintained at an optimum to prevent the lipase denaturing. What is the reason for this? Now, as we all know, as the pH decreases, the concentration of hydrogen ions increases. And because hydrogen ions are charged particles, they could potentially interact with the bonds and the ionic bonds holding the tertiary structure of the enzyme. When this happens and the hydrogen ions interacts with the active site, altering the tertiary structure and the bonding of the enzyme, the, the active site ends up changing shape. When this happens, when the active site changes shape completely, this means that the enzyme is now denatured. 
Therefore, this is why the pH must be kept to an optimum to prevent this happening. Now, the process of the reaction here it says the hydrolysis of triglycerides. As we all know, triglycerides are made of fatty acids, three fatty acids, and glycerol. And we all, we all know that fatty acids are acidic. Acidic meaning that they have a lower pH. A lower pH means that they change the concentration or increase the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. A, the addition of water molecules produced by hydrolysis increases the pH. No, it's not the addition of water molecules, this is incorrect. B, the products of hydrolysis decrease the pH. Yes, this is correct because as we said that fatty acids lower the pH and this is why the enzymes would denature because it increases the concentration of hydrogen ions which alters the ionization of the active site. First C, the products of hydrolysis increase the pH. Now this is incorrect. D, the removal of water molecules used in hydrolysis decreases pH. So it's not the removal of water molecules that decreases the pH. This is also incorrect and the correct answer must be B. Question number 16, an experiment was carried out to compare the effect of pH on the activity of an enzyme that was in solution and the same enzyme that has been immobilized on a gel. All other variables were kept the same. The results are shown in the graph, which statements explains these results when the enzyme is immobilized. So when the enzyme is immobilized, it is protected. Therefore, it becomes more stable and less prone to changes of pH or temperature. Therefore, the enzyme becomes more stable. And on the other hand, in the process of immobilizing, what could happen is the enzyme could change the shape of the active site due to the process of immobilizing. Now, which statement explains these results when the enzyme is immobilized? Here we could see that immobilized enzymes have a higher optimum pH than the enzymes in solution. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. The primary structure has changed. The primary structure never changes. It's the sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide. And immobilizing does not alter. For B, the secondary structure has changed. Now also, this is not possible because as we said, what determines the shape of the active site is the tertiary structure. For the enzyme to change the optimum pH, it's, it must have changed the shape of its active site or the tertiary structure. Now for C, the tertiary structure has changed. Yes, this is correct because of, of the points we just mentioned. For D, the quaternary structure has changed. No, this is incorrect. It does not alter the active site shape. Therefore, the correct answer must be C. Question number 17. High concentrations of ethanol can disrupt cell membrane structure and make the cell surface membrane leaky. Yeast cells release ethanol as a waste product of metabolism. Yeast cells can alter the composition of the cell surface membrane to reduce the effect of ethanol. Which statement would explain why the effect of ethanol is reduced? Now for A, a greater proportion of phospholipid may increase the entry of ethanol via channel proteins. Now, a greater proportion of proteins could potentially increase the entry. So obviously specific proteins may increase the entry of ethanol, but not the phospholipids. Actually, phospholipids would decrease the permeability. Now for B, an increase in hydrophobic interaction by phospholipid tails improves membrane stability. Now, as we all know, the longer the phospholipid tails, the more hydrophobic interactions they would have with other phospholipids as well. This means that they pack closer together. Then packing closer together by hydrophobic interactions makes the membrane less permeable and less fluid. Therefore, it improves its stability in general. Therefore, B is going to be correct. C. An increase in proportion of fatty acids with double bonds decreases the membrane fluidity. Actually, it increases the membrane fluidity. The reason for this is that fatty acids with double bonds have kinks with them, unlike unsaturated fatty acids. They have kinks. Now, these kinks prevent the phospholipid molecules packing closer together, just like B for example. Therefore, the membrane becomes 
more fluid because there are now more spaces between the phospholipid molecules. Therefore, this is incorrect. It does not explain how the effect of ethanol is reduced. Now for D, the shorter hydrocarbon chain of Y decreases membrane fluidity. No, the longer hydrocarbon chain decreases the membrane fluidity. The reason for this is the longer the chain, the more hydrophobic interactions and the more interactions in general. The more interactions there are, as we said here, the phospholipids pack closer together if they are longer chains. Therefore, D is going to be incorrect, it should be longer. Therefore, the correct answer must be B. Question number 18, the photomicrograph shows the appearance of onion epidermal cells after they have been soaked in solution X for one hour. What fills the space labeled Y? Now, as you could see here, the plant cells looks plasmalized. The reason for this is that the cell wall here, so that's the cell wall, is separated from the cell surface membrane and the cytoplasm in general. Now, this could happen due to the solution X having a lower water potential than the cell, therefore water from the cell moved out and it became plasmalized. Now, what would happen is what fills the space Y is now the solution. The solution is the only thing that actually fills the space and enters in that area. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. And A was a common misconception. It can never be air. The reason for this is that we know that cellulose cell walls are actually freely permeable. Freely, freely permeable, this means that the solution X could pass easily through the cell wall. It won't block the passing of any substance and store air in it. Therefore, air is incorrect. And the answer is going to be C. Question number 19. Equal sized potato pieces were placed into a test tube and covered with a sucrose solution. The test tube was left for 30 minutes. All other variables were controlled. After 30 minutes, the potato piece has not changed in size. What can be concluded from this result? Now, if a potato piece is placed in a solution where it hasn't changed in size, this means that there has not been any net movement of water. in or out. Net movement of water is the movement of water inside and outside at a constant rate. And this means that the water potential of the solution was the same as the water potential of the potato. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. For A, the concentration of sucrose is the same in the potato and in the solution. Now let's first start with this first point. Now concentration of sucrose can never be correct. Here we're talking about the water potential. The reason for this is that we cannot guarantee 100% that the concentration of sucrose in the potato is the same. The reason for this is there are also other minerals and substances dissolved in the potato other than sucrose. Therefore we cannot guarantee 100% is going to be sucrose. And if we are talking about the changing in size of the potatoes, we must mention the water potential, not the concentration of sucrose. We can say concentration of solute. That would be more correct answer. Now, let's move on to C. The water potential is the same in the potato and in the sucrose solution. Now, this part is correct. As we mentioned here, we mentioned the water potential. And there is no more movement of water into or out of the potato. Now, this is not possible. There's no more movement of water. So, because there hasn't been a waterproof material blocking the movement of water. Now, this is incorrect. For D, the water potential is the same in the potato and in the su sucrose solution. Now, this is correct. And there's no net movement of water into or out of the potato. So, this basically means that the water keeps moving into and out of the potato at the same rate. This is what no more net movement means. So, moves in at the same rate. So this is a more correct answer, but you can never ever say that there's no more movement of water into or out. There is movement of water into or out, but at the same rate as the rate entry and the rate exit. Therefore, the correct answer must be D. Question number 20, which row shows the correct number of each component of a single chromosome during prophase of mitosis? 
Now, during prophase, this is what a chromosome looks like. The chromosome contains two chromatids. Now, let's start with centromeres. Centromeres is the component here holding the two sister chromatids together, and as you can see, it only contains one. So this is correct for chromatids. We just mentioned it contains two chromatids. Now, for polynucleotide strands, as we all know that each chromatid contains a DNA strand because DNA is a double helix. Therefore, each chromatid is going to contain two polynucleotide strands. And here, because we have two chromatids, therefore we have four polynucleotide strands. So four is going to be the correct answer. Don't forget, each chromatid has a single DNA strand or two polynucleotide strands. Now for telomeres. Telomeres are present at both ends of each chromatid to protect the chromatid from gene loss or gene shortening. Therefore here, because we have two on each chromatid, this means that we are going to have four in total and the correct answer is going to be B. Question number 21. The cell cycle includes mitosis, which are features of nuclear division. 1. Forms cells of equal size to the parent cell. Now, when a cell divides, let's assume here it's dividing, it would form actually smaller cells than the parent cell. And it's not exactly identical because the organelles are almost shared, but not shared equally between the two new cells. Therefore, this is incorrect for two. Forms genetically identical nuclei. Of course, mitosis must form genetically identical nuclei. Otherwise, a mutation could take place. Therefore, this is incorrect. 3. Semi-conservative replication of DNA. This is incorrect. Semi-conservative replication happens in the S phase during prophase, not during mitosis. Therefore, this is incorrect and the correct answer is going to be D. 22. The RNA triplet UAG acts as a stop colon terminating the synthesis of a polypeptide. So we're looking for UAG on the mRNA molecule. The diagram shows a strand of DNA which codes for four amino acids. Where would an insertion, mutation of a thymine nucleotide result in the termination of translation? Now here, I've converted the DNA nucleotides to mRNA code to be understood further. Now here we could see UGA. So as you all know, thymine pairs with adenine on an mRNA molecule. So what we're looking for here is to insert adenine into an mRNA to make UAG. Now here you could see UNG. So if we inserted adenine in the middle, this would give us UAG in this area here. And if we inserted thymine at here, the DNA code is also going to give us UAG as an mRNA code. Therefore, B is going to be the correct answer. Question number 23, what is correct for uracil? So uracil is a single ring structure. This is correct because uracil is a pyrimidine found in mRNA molecules and tRNA. Now it is a purine. Now, as you said, it's a pyrimidine, so this is incorrect. And it joins its complementary base with two hydrogen bonds. Now uracil binds with adenine via two hydrogen bonds and cytosine binds with guanine via three hydrogen bonds. Therefore, two is going to be correct and the answer is going to be B. Question number 24. The photomicrograph shows a vascular bundle which describes the relationship of water potential in the labeled cells. Now, first of all, let's identify this photomicrograph and it's a cross section through a stem. And this is the vascular bundle. And as we all know, towards the outside is going to be the phloem. So one is the phloem. And towards the inside or the larger circles, as you could clearly see here, is going to be the xylem. Because xylem vessel elements are larger in diameter than the phloem. Phloem is the smaller ones. Now, for two here, is going to be the pip. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here which describes the relationship of water potential. Now for A, cell 3 is less negative than cell 1. So a less negative water potential means a higher water potential. 
And this is actually correct because cell 3, we said, is going to be the xylem. And xylem transports water mainly in mineral ions. Therefore, it's very obvious that xylem would have a higher water potential than phloem because phloem transports amino acids and sucrose. Therefore, phloem would definitely have a lower water potential and a higher concentration of sucrose in solutes. Therefore, A is correct. Now, let's see B. Cell 2 is less negative than cell 3. So, less negative means it has a higher water potential. Now, this is totally incorrect because the pith or the surrounding tissue could never have a higher water potential than the xylem, which its main function is to transport water and mineral ions. For C, cell 3 is more negative than cell 1 and 2. More negative means a lower water potential. Obviously, this is incorrect. The cells 1, 2, and 3 have the same water potential. This is also incorrect and we've explained why. Therefore, the correct answer must be A. Question number 25. Which features have a role in the transport of water in xylem vessel elements? 1. Capillary action. So as we see here, the definition of capillary action is the movement of liquid along a surface of a solid caused by the attraction of molecules of the liquid to the molecules of the solid. Now, in basic terms, it means that the adhesion force is stronger than the cohesion between water molecules. And this is the reason why water molecules are pulled up in the first place, is because the adhesion force is stronger than the cohesion, which pulls it upwards. Therefore, this is correct. 2. Cohesion. As we all know, cohesion is the formation of hydrogen bonds between water molecules. Therefore, they pull each other up in a continuous and constant column upwards. Now, three, hydrogen bonding. Of course, both adhesion and cohesion depend on hydrogen bonding. Therefore, it's vital and the answer is going to be A. Question number 26, what is a definition of transpiration? So transpiration is the loss of water vapor through the stomata of the leaf. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. A, the evaporation of water vapor from a leaf due to the diffusion of water from an area of low water potential to high water potential. This is incorrect. It's supposed to be from high to low. Therefore, this is incorrect. B, the loss of water vapor from a plant to its environment by diffusion down a water potential gradient. Yes, this is correct. As we said, it's loss of water vapor through the stomata down a water potential gradient. And the correct answer is going to be B. Question number 27, which are present in walls of arteries? So artery wall consists of three parts. It's tunica intima, which is the inner layer, tunica media, which is the middle layer, and tunica externa, which is the outer layer. The tunica intima is made of a layer of endothelium. So this is present. So endothelium is correct and it's present in tunica intima. Now for smooth muscle, elastic tissue, and collagen fibers, here we have an acronym, CES. Collagen, elastic, and smooth muscle. All three of them are present in the tunica media, which is the middle layer, so tunica media, and tunica externa. But I'm going to tell you a tip here, which is vital, and did come in a past paper question before that tunica media has a higher proportion of or mainly made up of elastic fibers and smooth muscles. So elastic fibers and smooth muscles mainly. This did come in a past paper question and it was a common misconception. But the tunica externa, its main constituent are collagen. Now be careful for this point. Now as we can see here that all three are actually present, therefore the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 28, these statements list some of the events in the cardiac cycle. They are not in correct order. Which statements describe the fifth of these events to occur in the cardiac cycle? So the first one we all know is going to be the sinoatrial node initiating an excitation wave through the atrium. So we start with the contracting of sinoatrial node. Then what happens is that the wave of excitation sweeps across the atria as we said then what happens is after the wave of excitation has spread the atria now contracts therefore this is the third one now after the atria contracts the excitation wave travels to the atrioventricular node or the avn where it delays the impulse 0.1 seconds 
The reason for this is that the atrium and the ventricles do not contract at the same time. Now, three is going to be the fourth one. And then what happens is after the atrioventricular node delayed the impulse, it travels down along this line, along the bundle of his, and down to the perkine tissue. Therefore, perkine tissue is going to be the fifth one. After it came down to the perkine tissue, now the way sweeps upwards from the base of the ventricles up to here. Therefore, this is going to be the sixth one. And then after the contraction has moved up till here, then the ventricles contract. And this is going to be the seventh step. Now here's asking for the fifth one. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Question number 29, which sure correctly identifies the molecules or cells that are present in the different locations? Now, type of molecule or cell, antibodies. As we all know, antibodies are released by B lymphocytes and they are mainly released into the blood. Then it travels through to the lymph and tissue fluid. Therefore, this is going to be incorrect because it's mainly present in the blood. Now for B, large plasma proteins. As we all know, large plasma proteins stay in the blood capillaries. The reason for this is that the endothelium pores are not large enough to allow those large plasma proteins to pass through to the tissue fluid. Therefore, this is incorrect. For C, lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are present in both blood, lymph and tissue fluid. Therefore, this is incorrect. D. Phagocytes. Phagocytes are like neutrophils and macrophages and they engulf pathogens. Therefore, they must be present in also all three, blood, tissue fluid and lymph. Therefore, the only correct answer that makes sense is going to be D. Question number 30. When active tissues have high carbon dioxide concentrations, oxyhemoglobin releases oxygen to these tissues. What encourages this release in the presence of high concentrations of carbon dioxide? When the concentration of carbon dioxide increases, what happens is that now more carbon dioxide combines with water, forming carbonic acid by the action of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And this takes place inside red blood cells. Now what happens is that this carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. The bicarbonate moves to the outside of the red blood cell and the hydrogen ion stays inside. Now what happens is that that hydrogen ion combines with hemoglobin forming hemoglobinic acid. And this hemoglobinic acid has a really low affinity to oxygen. Therefore, what happens is that hemoglobin end up releasing oxygen. Now, therefore, mainly what causes the release of oxygen are going to be hydrogen ions. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, carboxyhemoglobin forms more readily. Now, this is incorrect because carboxyhemoglobin forms when carbon dioxide binds to the terminal amine group. Obviously, this is correct. It has nothing to do with hydrogen ions. Therefore, this is incorrect. For two, oxyhemoglobin dissociates more readily. Of course, it does dissociate due to the hydrogen ions binding to hemoglobin forming hemoglobinic acid, which has a low affinity to oxygen, therefore it gets released. For three, hemoglobin needs higher concentrations of oxygen to become saturated. Now, this is also correct. Now, because hemoglobinic acid has a lower affinity to oxygen, therefore this means that it would require higher concentration of oxygen to become saturated. Therefore, the correct answer must be D. Question number 31, the graph shows oxygen dissociation curves of hemoglobin at two different carbon dioxide concentrations. The partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs is 100 and the partial pressure of oxygen in metabolically active tissues are 35. What is the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen at the lungs and in metabolically active tissues? Now, as we all know, here we could see two lines. This line represents the one with a 
higher carbon dioxide concentration because it shifted to the right and this one represents the one with the lower carbon dioxide concentration. As we all know in metabolically active tissues there is a higher concentration of carbon dioxide therefore this line and this area here represents the metabolically active tissues and the percentage saturation is approximately going to be around here because in metabolically active tissues there is a lower concentration of oxygen. Contrasting the lungs, the lungs has a lower concentration of carbon dioxide therefore we're looking at this line and has a higher concentration of oxygen therefore the lung is going to be somewhere up here and this is a general rule and it works on every single graph with these two examples. Now let's see suggestions that we have here. We're trying to work out the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. Now here, we have the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs and it's going to be 100. Therefore, what we do is we draw a line upwards. And because it's the lungs, we're looking at this line right here. And then we draw a line from here to this area here. If you look carefully, you're going to find that it's going to be 94%. Therefore, this is correct. And for metabolically active tissue, we do exactly the same thing. So here for 35, it's going to be approximately around here. And then we draw a line to here. And it's going to approximately give us 40. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. Question number 32, which statement is correct? A. Alveoli have goblet cells to produce mucus. Now, alveoli do not have goblet cells, so this is incorrect. Cartilage in bronchi keeps the bronchi open and allows air to flow through freely. So, yes, bronchi does contain cartilage. It contains irregular blocks of cartilage. Therefore, this is correct. For C, complete rings of cartilage in bronchioles. Now, bronchioles do not even contain cartilage, so this is incorrect. D, during exercise, muscles in bronchioles and alveoli relax to allow a greater flow of air. This is incorrect. The muscles of the trachea is what relaxes. Therefore, the correct answer must be B. 33. Four types of cell in the gas exchange system are listed. The text in the table shows specialized features of three of these types of cells, which are correctly matches the specialized feature with the correct cell. Now, here in cell 3, we could see many mitochondria, lots of endoplasmic reticulum, and many Golgi body. This clearly indicates it has an active protein synthesis and secretion. And in this case, it's definitely going to be a goblet cell, which is L. The reason for this is that it actively secretes mucus. Now, because we cannot distinguish between 1 and 2 because they are the same features, therefore, the only correct or logical answer is going to be C. Question number 35. The diagram shows properties of diseases, which shows the properties that are common to tuberculosis and measles. Now, tuberculosis... It is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and it is a bacterium and it is infectious and it is also transmitted by airborne droplets. So all three of these are correct for tuberculosis. But for measles, measles is actually moved from the syllabus starting from 2022 onwards, but in this case measles is actually a virus. Therefore, it's not bacterial. So A, B and C is going to be incorrect and the answer is going to be D. Question number 36, the diagram shows some of the pathogens that cause disease in humans and some of the ways they are transmitted. What is the correct pathogen and method of transmission for cholera? So cholera is caused by bacterium vibrio cholerae and it is a bacterium here so one is correct and it's transmitted by fecal oral route via contaminated water with sewage for example. Therefore. W is going to be correct, and the answer is 1 in W, which is A. Question number 37. Different antibiotics function in different ways. It is important that the antibiotic kills the bacteria but does not harm the infected human. The antibiotic tetracycline has been found to affect the way in which human mitochondria function. Which statements could explain why human mitochondria function is affected by tetracycline? So here it says the antibiotic kills bacteria. Now, as you all know that mitochondria actually has prokaryotic origins because bacteria has 
70s ribosomes and circular dna and also don't forget that mitochondria has a circular dna like bacteria and prokaryotic cells and 70s ribosomes now let's see the suggestions that we have here a antibiotic prevents the synthesis of peptidoglycan cell walls now this is incorrect peptidoglycan cell walls are not even present in mitochondria for b the antibiotic prevents synthesis of the linear DNA. So linear DNA is the DNA found inside the nucleus and they are not found in prokaryotic cells. So neither in mitochondria or bacteria. So this is incorrect. C. The antibiotic prevents translation of circular DNA. Now circular DNA is not even translated. It's replicated by semi-conservative DNA replication. Therefore, translation is totally incorrect for D. The antibiotic prevents translation by binding to 70S ribosomes. Yes, this is correct because 70S ribosomes are common in both prokaryotic cells and mitochondria. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be D. Question number 38. Immune response to a vaccination against the virus can be assessed by making three measurements. What describes the immunity of an individual? when the values of 1, 2, and 3 are all low 10 years after vaccinations. So please ignore this fact that they are both low after the vaccination here. It's telling you a fact that the person has been vaccinated. And as you all know, vaccination is active artificial immunity. And what happens is that when antigens are presented to the B cells, B cells are simulated to divide into plasma cells and memory cells, which stay long term in the body. Now, let's see suggestions that we have here. A. Active immunity due to the presence of memory cells. Yes, it is active immunity because antigens have been injected within the vaccine. Now, and memory cells are present. This is correct because antigens stimulate B cells to divide into plasma and memory cells are b low immunity due to the absence of antibodies now an immunity cannot be low it can only be low due to the absence of antigens stimulating the b cells to divide into plasma and memory cells therefore this is incorrect and this is also incorrect the passive immunity due to the presence of antibodies now this is incorrect. Antibodies are not injected within the vaccine. It's antigens that are injected and therefore it's going to be active immunity, never passive. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 39. The enzyme telomerase prevents loss of telomeres after many mitotic cell cycles. Which type of white blood cell involved in an autoimmune condition will contain active telomerase? So cells which contain active telomerase is the ones that divide at a rapid rate. And in autoimmune conditions, memory cells are produced for self-antigens. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. Now, mature B lymphocyte plasma cells. As we all know, plasma cells don't divide. It's memory cells that divide. Therefore, this is incorrect. Neutrophils. Neutrophils never have a high rate of telomeres, therefore this is incorrect as well. Now, helper T lymphocyte memory cells. As we all know, memory cells keeps dividing to produce plasma cells and more T lymphocytes. Therefore, this is going to be correct and the answer is going to be C. Question number 40. Which features of monoclonal antibodies make them useful in the diagnosis and treatment of disease? One. A particular monoclonal antibody attaches to a specific antigen. Now, a feature of antibodies is that they are specific. And if it attaches to a specific antigen, this means a specific target cell could be targeted. So only a few cells could be targeted, not the whole body. And this makes them useful in the diagnosis of disease. For example, cancer cells. It makes them easier to identify cancer cells with different antigens. Therefore, this is correct. Two, identical monoclonal antibodies can be produced in large numbers. Now, this is true because the plasma cells removed from the spleen of a mammal can combine with a myeloma cell. And then they fuse together using a fusogen, forming a hybridoma cell which secretes continuous supply of antibodies therefore this is correct three binding 
a monoclonal antibody to its specific antigen may mark that antigen for destruction by white blood cells now this is correct as we gave an example of cancer cells here because they are specific for only a few types of antigens therefore specific cells could be targeted and then monoclonal antibodies binding could actually trigger or put a red mark or a warning sign for the immune system to come and attack those specific cells so this is correct Number 4. Fluorescent or radioactive markers can be attached to a monoclonal antibody to show where the antigen is in the body. Coming back to point 3, it's exactly the same thing and this is correct. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. If you found this video useful, I'd highly appreciate it if you would take a moment out of your very busy day and subscribe and like this video.